Hello everyone, how's it going? In the last video, we were able to connect the wave-particle duality of electrons to atomic orbitals, and from atomic orbitals, we were able to talk about molecular orbitals with looking at hydrogen and the formation of H2. But in this video, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into talking about chemical bonding. Before we can talk more about chemical bonding, we have to talk about how electrons behave in atomic orbitals. First of all, there is two electrons per atomic orbital. Now, this might be hard to understand since not two electrons have the same quantum number set. This is because of spin. Each electron will have a different spin value that is usually represented by ms. One will have a positive one half, and then the other will have a negative one half. But even though electrons can pair because of opposite spins, According to Hund's rule, it takes energy to pair an electron. So, when filling in orbitals, electrons would rather be unpaired filling in single orbitals before they begin pairing up. And we can see this when we do electron configuration. Like in the example I have here for carbon. You see how we first make sure that we fill in one electron before we start pairing it? Another point that we have to dive a little bit deeper into is that Chemical bonding is a little bit more complicated than just constructive and destructive waves with bonding and anti-bonding. Electrons are negatively charged. So yes, we are talking about electron probabilities with atomic orbitals, but the electrons within these orbitals are negatively charged. So, like the same side of two magnets, there's going to be some repulsion. This is where we're introduced to the VESPER model, the Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Model. More or less, what the valence shell is, is the highest energy atomic orbitals of a specific atom. So that usually results to the highest principal quantum number that atom has. So the VESPER model talks about how a central atom will rearrange its bonding groups to minimize repulsion and energy. As we can see here with the first option, which is linear, well, the greatest distance that we can have two things is on opposite ends. Hence, when we have a central atom and two bonding groups, we're going to have a linear geometry, 180 degrees, and that's the farthest they can be. And when we slowly start adding more and more bonding groups, we get more complicated shapes, such as with three and trigonal planar, four with tetrahedral, and five with trigonal bipyramidal. There's a difference between electron groups and bonding groups. Bonding groups only consider the other atoms interacting with that central atom, whereas electron groups consider the lone pairs as well. Remember, the lone pairs are electrons that are already paired part of that central atom, and because they're already paired, they're not going to contribute in the chemical bonding. This means that they lie closer to that central atom and will have a greater repulsion factor on the bonding groups. This is why when we have lone pairs, we have geometry with bent shapes, that the angles are slightly disordered. When we're trying to predict the molecular geometry of a certain molecular compound or bond, we have to know the central atom, the amount of lone pairs that central atom has, and the number of bonding groups. We have three examples, three compounds, showing there are three different geometries. You have water with two lone pairs, ammonia with one lone pair, and methane with zero lone pairs. Even though the VESPER model is really helpful to help us understand how central atoms are gonna rearrange bonding groups to lower the repulsive forces, atomic orbitals don't naturally have those shapes. And this is where we get into the topic of talking about hybridization. Even though methane wants that tetrahedral shape for the four hydrogens it's bonding with, each of those bonding orbitals have to be equal energy, equal length, and equal shape. So in order to do this, we talk about hybridization. And this is the steps that we take to hybridize for methane, or what we call sp3 hybridized. First of all, we know for carbon that we have two unpaired electrons in the two p orbitals and a paired electron set in the 2s. So in order to create four equal bonding orbitals, well, one electron from the 2s orbital is gonna get excited and be promoted into the empty 
2p orbital. This creates four unpaired electrons. Now what happens is we're gonna hybridize these orbitals. We're gonna merge the one 2s orbital with three 2p orbitals to form four 2p orbitals. This gives us two sp3. Now, because all these orbitals are the same size, they can get arranged in the tetrahedral shape to bond with the four hydrogens methane is associated with. With this example, we were only analyzing single bonds. Hybridization gets a little bit more difficult when we talk about double bonds because of the nature of double bonds. There's two main types of bonding that we can refer to. We can talk about sigma bonding and pi bonding. Sigma bonding is a head-on merger or overlap of the two atomic orbitals. This increases the density between the two atoms. Interesting enough, sigma bonds can fully re-rotate 180 degrees along the bonding axis. Pi bonds are a little different. Pi bonds are lateral interactions and that come from unhybridized p and later on we'll talk about d orbitals. Interesting though is that pi bonds cannot rotate but the interesting, more interesting thing is that they only happen from unhybridized p orbitals. So we have to make sure we have unhybridized orbitals to function for that double and triple bonding. So let's look at an example for a double bond. We can look at ethene, the double bond between two carbons. Each carbon has a double bond between themselves and two single bonds with two other hydrogens. Now, looking at the Vesper theory, we know that if we have three bonding groups, we're gonna have a trigonal planar geometry. And this is true still. We're gonna excite that one electron like we did with a methane hybridization. But instead of merging all four orbitals together, we're gonna merge three together, keeping one p orbital unhybridized. This is gonna form a 2sp2 orbital. These orbitals will have that trigonal planar geometry where that one unhybridized p orbital is gonna stay the same. That one unhybridized p orbital is gonna react with the other unhybridized p orbital of the other carbon, causing that double bond. The single bond happens between the sigma bond of the two sp2 orbitals of the two carbons. I know that was a little bit of a tongue twister, but I hope it came off. I hope it came off clearly. When we reference the hybridization of triple bonds, it's really similar to what we talked about with double bonds. So let's talk about ethyne. Each carbon is triple bonded to another carbon in this scenario, and single bonded to a hydrogen. This leaves two bonding groups, and according to Vesper theory, we should see that 180 linear geometry. So, let's look at the hybridization. Like we did before, we're going to excite that one electron, but instead of merging all four of them, we're only going to merge two, leaving us with two sp orbitals, the one that contributes in the single bond between the carbon and hydrogen, and the other that contributes in the single bond between the carbon and carbon leaving two unhybridized p orbitals that are going to participate in the double and triple bonds. And since both carbons do this, we have the double bond and triple bond between those two unhybridized p orbitals. This is what gives us that linear geometry. The thing about hybridization tells us a lot about how the atomic orbitals are oriented in space for different bonding types, bonding conditions, and the different number of bonding groups. I hope this video was helpful to help you learn about Vesper and orbital hybridization. All the graphics that you see me use in this video are allowed for free download over on my website. I'll put the link below in the description. And I hope you guys have a great day.